Hi, we're here live from the NTI. We're going to walk through a dynamic assessment of fluid responsiveness, a passive leg raise. Our patient is a 52-year-old male who was diagnosed with pneumonia, which turned to sepsis. He is currently here, and as we can see, his map is a little soft. He is already on vasopressor, but what we want to try to see is, would it be better to treat him with some additional fluid, or should we continue with the vasopressor? So in order to do that, we're going to do what's called a passive leg raise. Again, a dynamic assessment of fluid responsiveness. We're going to turn to the Starling monitor, which works by placing four sensors on the patient's thorax, two above the heart and two below, as you can see here, right? There and there. And then the upper sensors are over here, right? So we connect them into the patient cable. We enter the patient's age, height, and weight, and the monitor starts to run. It's a continuous monitor that's gonna give us stroke volume and then populate about 19 other parameters. What we're interested in though is seeing how does the stroke volume change if we make an intervention like giving fluid. So I'm just gonna press the start PLR protocol here on the monitor. And since it's been running uh, long enough, we already have a bunch of baseline data. So we're going to be able to go right to the part where we lift the legs. So I'm just going to show you the monitor gives us a picture on how to uh, reposition the patient. So we're going to place the head of the bed down. We're going to use our assist lift device to help rest the patient's legs. And then we're going to let the monitor tell us how much the stroke volume actually changes. Now, let's just take a step back and talk about what's actually happening when we lift the patient's legs. So if a patient is sitting up, anywhere between say 250 and 300 cc's of blood will actually sequester in the calves. Um, you have to remember before you do this to pause the SCDs to allow that blood to actually gather there. That blood is actually gonna act like a non-invasive fluid challenge to help us determine whether or not we have a patient who is a fluid responder. So basically, as the heart is beating, we are able to deliver that blood in a very quick fashion. We get to see as that blood strikes the ventricle, does the ventricle stretch out and accept it? And can the heart actually push it forward, right? Why is this important? Because when you are looking at a hemodynamically unstable patient, only 50% of those patients are fluid responders. The other 50% are not. This test helps us to see in real time which one we have, okay? So what we're looking for is a 10% or greater improvement in the patient's stroke volume index. If that patient does have that improvement, what we can say is it predicts how they will respond to 500 cc's of crystalloid it will be able to help us to see what we need to do to treat that soft mat. So we have a couple of more uh, seconds to our results. I also want to take a minute to discuss how this maneuver actually helps hospitals meet their SEP1 guideline for CMS. The SEP1 guideline for sepsis care has actually entered the area of value-based purchasing starting January 1st of this year, 2024. How does this type of maneuver help you to meet your SEP1 guideline? In the beginning of the care of a septic patient, patients who are experiencing septic shock, we are asked to give a 30 cc per kilogram bolus. Some clinicians are concerned about that because the patient may have a history of uh, congestive heart failure. They may have end-stage renal disease. Um, but this test, if performed, allows the clinicians to document a potential change in stroke volume or cardiac output, gives them an objective way to say that fluids are not indicated. In the second three hours, they can use the same type of dynamic assessment to reassess volume status and, again, be the part where you can meet the measure of the CMS guidelines. So. 
What this also does for clinical outcomes, according to a prospective randomized control trial, is if we use this method to choose whether or not a patient would benefit from fluid or vasopressors, you actually can see a decrease in the overall fluid balance, uh, less need for mechanical ventilation, less need for continual renal replacement therapy, and the ability to discharge patients home alive uh, from the hospital, not send them to an LTAC or a rehab unit. So we actually have our results now. So let's walk through it. If you can pick up, you see a red box that is actually in the, um, the uh, flat part of the Starling curve, indicating just from afar that the patient is not fluid responsive, right? And his percentage is 2.7%, so less than 10%. This patient is a non-fluid responder, and what we would do is actually turn to our vasopressor and try to titrate up until we reach our desired map. So in conclusion, doing dynamic assessments in the care of uh, the septic patient to help manage their fluids leads to better outcomes both financially and clinically, and also helps hospitals to meet their SEP1 measure, which is now, again, a part of value-based purchasing.